Hi. Hey, Rose. How are you? Good, good, good. Welcome to the desert island. And you look so good. Thank you. Yeah, that, you know, the tan, the shirt, the background are you really, is beautiful. Are you really from England? I don't, I don't believe it. <laughs> and and, and um, how are you? How are you keeping? Good. good. Yeah, we're all fine. Very good. good. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Been fine. So welcome to the Desert Island. We may be here for some time, um, Bernard. So I'd uh, love to talk to you maybe about some watches that you managed to pack to bring with you um, to get us through this time together on the island. I've got, as ever, my secret recipe coconut drink. Did you manage to bring a drink with you? Yeah, I captured, I captured a drink for my daughter. A little olive glass with some funky juice. Cheers. Happy holidays, indeed. So let's, all, kick the, <laughs> so let's kick things off. Let's yeah. talk about watches. What's the first one that you want to share with us? Oh yeah, it's 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 a good one. Maybe it's still my my, my grail piece. It is. Uh, interesting thing is, I showed you quickly, so you can see a little bit. Oh it's wow! A, it's a six two six five Daytona. Yes, I have a backlight bezel on it, but what I do is I switch styles and stuff all the time. So I switch back and forward between backlight and steel. I enjoy the 6265 often on, on a strap, but on the Jubilee I wear this one a lot with the, with the backlight because there's a nice contrast in it. And I enjoy watches, sports watches on Jubilees also. And it's for me always a watch that, that reminds me on the really beginning of when I started collecting. Then there was always the, the vintage Daytona was always my grail watch back then and I really you know when you think back on those days when I started buying the first vintage Rolex and then I guess many people have had that rush that you rush from one to another watch that you rush now I want to have a Submariner then you wanted to try to Sea Dweller and Explorer and all these kind of things because you discovered a whole new world with a lot of stories and, and, and knowledge but always there was at the top of the line for me was the, at that point was the uh, vintage Daytona. And I still remember maybe that reflects always that area which was such a cool, cool community and the trust and friendships amongst each other that you, you know, you won that forums like two, three hours a day, uh, emails, phone calls with people from all over the world, new opens, uh, it, it opened completely new worlds, which was really, really, really yeah, so much fun back then. And I still remember finally getting my first own uh, vintage Daytona back then. In a summer holiday, I was sitting in a, somewhere at the beach in France, no internet connection. I had to go to some kind of bar to get a little bit of internet. Couldn't do nothing, you know, really old modern stuff like that. Old, old dial-up style. Yeah, dial-up style. And, and, and uh, uh, yeah, it's that old. I'm that old, yeah. But, but a good friend, Werner from, from, from Germany, you also know well, uh, you know, we were looking for Daytonas together. We wanted to do maybe a Daytona after the holiday together. We would buy those one together. And um, and during my holiday, I saw on a little bit of internet that he bought one uh, and posted it on the forum. I was like, oh, Werner, you, you didn't wait for me. You already got yours. And he said like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And I said like, yeah, but you mostly, as I know, you probably will sell it in three weeks anyway or in a month so maybe you know then and he was like yeah you're right you know what give me your address and i sent you the watch now i was like yeah but i'm in the middle of france no internet i can't pay from here i can't do nothing you know i mean we, we never met before we only had talks on the forums and then, and he just sent the watch box papers and that all also was for me really like you know, very magic of that community back then, the trust, the friendships, and also, you know, that, that past that you walk together with all the guys, you know, discovering these new worlds, and a lot of still also back then discovering a lot of new knowledge, new things, details. So it's a really exciting time. So I, even this watch reminds me every time of, of these times. Yeah. Let me and do a screen share. You, you sent me a, an amazing pic. You are um, <laughs> such an incredible photographer. Here we go. We just look at that watch. It's stunning, isn't it? Yeah, I really love it. You know, and, and what I really find so interesting of this design, and for me, it was always like the, you know, the most iconic design with Rolex. It's, it's so balanced. I mean, it's it's funny when you imagine back then in those days, this was cheaper than a Dayjust and a Submariner. When you see yeah, the whole yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, back then they 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 sat in a shop. They weren't that popular, but. For me, they are really the, the stylish, you know, I'm all about the style and design of these things, not so much yeah. about movement. I'm not a movement guy. For me, it always has to do something with me on my wrist and has to resonate. Uh, 
mm. in aesthetics. And, and this for me still is the most beautiful watch that's ever made. Yeah. And after I got my first one, which was a big red uh, Daytona, um, I had a few, quite a few, uh, even up to a tropical uh, Fuerza Era del Peru that I really regret selling for to fund the Porsche. So that was shitty. <laughs> yeah, you sold a really great Daytona and bought a really terrible oh, Porsche. Yeah. I remember that. I remember that. And that Porsche was really, you know, I had to I had just return it after, I think, five or six months because I was done with it. Uh, yeah. I thought I bought a good one, but... Yeah, I regret selling that watch forever because now a tropical Daytona would be just just a dream with yeah. really like camel camel kind of eyes. Yeah. But the 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 the, um, the interesting thing that I discovered over the years with the Daytonas and and you know you remember back then I also had like the Newmans and back then then I found like suddenly when you had the one Grail you wanted to go to the next level and we discovered the Newmans and stuff like that. But you know, the Newmans was, was fantastic, but in today's market, for me, the Newmans are just way out of, of line and I wouldn't feel comfortable with it anymore. So now yeah. for me, it, it's back to basics in a way. You know, it's hard to tell basics for something like this these days, but it's, it's yeah. for me, it's still, you know, that, that, that grail piece. And what I discovered over the years that I like the ones without the big red Daytona, the earlier ones way more than the, than the later ones. Mm. really personal so even in the in the Daytona thing you can still find you know your own kind of way your own kind of uh, uh, preferences what kind of dial configurations you want or not mm. so I'm yeah I'm playing around with the bezels and, and just straps and bracelet and I also have the oyster bracelet changing yeah. the looks really enjoy that what I like about the old ones Ross is for me uh, the, 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 the earlier 70s one if you have Sigma, Sigma dial or if you have a nice black one with the silver print which is beautiful you have like almost like an, the, the surface feels different warmer than I think the later ones so I the, the big red for me feel a little bit more harsh and, 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 and poppy and I like the mm -hmm. little bit more connoisseur earlier ones yeah more balanced in my in my in my view so um yeah, cool. Yeah, I was really happy, you know, like a few years ago, I was at Parma and I found the bracelet, but especially with the rare uh, end links, because this is, these days has become a total hype. So yeah, find the 19 millimeter end links. And this is, you know, really special to wow. find. You can wear it on a Jubilee with the 74 end links and they are hard to find these days. But it's, yeah, I, I enjoy it really like this. Yeah. I mean, I this is so it's been an incredibly important watch to you and uh, we'll, we'll talk about Boulang and Sons and that journey uh, maybe later on but I mean I think it's important to contextualize your role in the kind of the emergence of vintage Rolex and its importance in terms of the collector's market because back you know before Boulang and Sons you used to um, well, you, you created the Rolex passion meetings which arguably were the first big scale get-togethers um, and, and so, you know, a lot of these watches that we're talking about were watches that back in the early days of the VRF and moving forward, you know, you guys created that knowledge and were part of the forum that really established the understanding of how important these watches were. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the interesting things on these times. Well, of course, I mean, I, I came in when there were already like big collectors and very knowledgeable people, you know, dear friends already there that did it for already like 20 years. You know, yeah. I, I think we all agree that the Italians, you know, created, created the, 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 the vintage Rolex love and, 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 and market yeah. in a way. So I, I never would, would have that kind of credits. But what's, what's interesting when I came into the market, for me, you know, my, my origin is, is design and branding and stuff like this. For me, it was always storytelling was the, was the part of it. And for me, it was always the interesting part of that watch as well. It never was technique or, or as I said, was, was aesthetics, but also very much the stories behind these watches mm. that I yeah, discovered. Yeah. You know, great watches when you talk often to original owners or you found out stories or sometimes military watches. You know, there was always that feeling for me like, hey, these watches have seen a life. They have been on a wrist from someone for 20, 30, 40 years and enjoyed their, you know, great moments, bad moments. For me, there was always the search also in vintage pieces to discover the beauty of aging, the beauty of where you can see sometimes his story. Sometimes, you know, if, if a watch is mint, it's, it's beautiful. But that kind of aging that you felt the mojo and the soul of the watch was for me always very important. So I always try to share that part of it mm. back then, when often in forums there was still talks about, uh, you know, details and technical and, and, and you know, it was, was more 
not nerdy, it's the wrong word, but it was more like focused on really collecting stuff. And I was always enthusiastic about the feeling that it gave me to wear a watch like this, to, 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 to share that heritage that the watch had in it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, of course, many of you know Philip Stahl and I, we, we, we met, we came in on from the same town. So we started to walk that path together and, and discovering this whole world and, and started to write about it, shoot it, put it into studio, shoot it on the wrist, adding, you know, styles and all these kind of things to it. So back in these days, I think that was kind of a little bit more new uh, back then. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we, you know, were very, very passionate about it, that we wrote so much and connected so many, many people. But what we discovered was like, hey, there are many great guides out there. And we all living behind a PC and talk about it every day. We are talking almost more to each other than to our wives or mm-hmm. at a certain period. Mm. But we never met, you know, there's no place where you could put all these watch along, watches on the table and really enjoy the details, compare them with each other, have them in the hand, try on a beautiful watch from someone else to, to understand if it's something for you or not for you or what is behind it. So at, at the point it was like, hey, we are all in this community so much together, but actually we never meet. And there, of course, was also a group that would go to auctions and meet there or watch fairs. Mm-hmm. But it was always sometimes more like a hunting and, and we wanted something really relaxed where you could really share your passion, feel very secure, but also um, completely unpretentious. So it really was a completely relaxed thing. Yeah. So we, we invited a, a group of, I think the first one was like 28, 29 people to join us in Maastricht, a little town in the Netherlands, in a completely relaxed atmosphere outside in a chateau. And it was fantastic, you know, the, the watches were put on a table, you could touch anything, you could try it on. People would leave their watch box with Newman's, Millsaps, Comex, whatever kind of pot and pending stuff was in there and just grab lunch and said, hey, play with it and I see it in half an hour, enjoy it. You know, that, that, that kind of atmosphere and, 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 and trust among, among each other was for me the biggest, biggest magic of all of this. So out of that sharing then, we took the pictures, of course, of this, we couldn't share the people which for me was the most important part of this meeting, really the friendships and the, and the, and the enthusiasm of, of the people with each other. You really could, for three days, you know, could, could, could lose yourself in all of this uh, without people saying you are mad or you're an idiot because back then when you did vintage Rolex, nobody in our environment would understand what you're really looking at or yeah. doing. Yeah, hey, yeah. You're talking for one and a half hour about the underline, about the two millimeter line, are you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> I remember that my first passion meeting, I think my, f- my first one, I think was the first in Amsterdam or maybe I, did I come to, I've been to a couple at the Chateau, but anyway, I remember having lunch on the day when, you know, um, all those watches on the table and just kind of just wandering up, putting on a different watch and enjoying that one for 10 minutes. Watches that, you know, were kind of these mythical, iconic watches that most people had only ever seen on the internet. Um, and yeah. all came together and to see all of those watches on one table at the same time was I think a huge shift in terms of how collecting and what, it, and, and, what, yeah. and what it made it all interesting I think Ross is because now you see these days you know so seen so many experts online and but most of them or many of them are suddenly experts out of you know talking about images uh, and the interesting of the passion meeting was but when you had like 25 humans on the table you could really compare them you could really feel them you know loop them really touch them go deep into the structure of the materials to understand them way more but same goes with all, all kind of other watches so for me it was really different from only you know talking about watches from pictures or having the ability to have i mean we had sometimes like three four or five hundred watches on the table um you know, like 35 big crowns or stuff like this. It was crazy time. It was like, insane. You couldn't, you yeah, couldn't imagine well. these days. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, our, our friends in Asia do these crazy stuff sometimes. Yeah. You know, last year New York was a blast. But still, you know, you had so many variety. A meeting with 35 mil subs on the table, or 33 hours. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. But then you can really, not, not it's about the prestige of the amount of the watches, but the really feel the watches. What did Patina with them? You know, how are they serviced? What did it do with them? What is a normal state of a really used watch for this kind of uh, dedication and everything? Yeah. So yeah. the knowledge for me was also way interesting that you really feel watches and, and, and really discover them live instead of thing. But the most important part of this was for me to discover the people behind these watches and just discover also the story behind these people. Because, you know, often now you see 
uh, someone is posting two newmans or three newmans and then people are like, wow, and whatever. But they sometimes forget the hours and hours and hours spent to get there, you know, starting first with one watch and third. And of course, you have people now, they say, oh, I buy my first vintage Rolex and I buy the newman in auction, blah, blah, blah. Mm. That, that's a part of it. But many of the friends we know, they have gone a pass to, to, to get there where they are. And they have paid a lot of money you know, in lessons learned, uh, they spend so much time in to get there. So it's also the stories behind this watch and understanding that it's just not buying something. It's really the whole past that, that gets you, that makes it so interesting. So, and meeting interesting people. And, and I think part of what you said, like, hey, you may be being part of the whole thing that vintage has been growing is yes, we shared them. You know, we always found it important also to take the pictures, put them on forums in hours of work. If you look, look now what you had to do, upload photos into photo bucket, copy the links and all this, you know, it was a two day job to just, you know, share the images of, of, of a meeting, which, um, but then you saw all these people react to it and also starting to, look into vintage that first were more in, in, in modern. They started to get interest in vintage and starting to, you know, see also the stories behind it. Mm -hmm. I think that was a big part of maybe where vintage is now, that, that, that there's more and more people got enthusiasmed by many people who did this, but yeah, partly, you know, uh, by the passion meetings and I did later the blog where I shared it, but also sharing it on forums, on, on Instagram. And now it has become a very, very big thing. Yeah. Indeed. yeah. So sticking with the, uh, the theme of uh, vintage Rolex, let's look at the next. I know the next watch is very important to you. Um, yeah. So let's talk as, about as, that. Yeah, well, important as, to both of us, but particularly. Yeah, to both of us. Yeah, it's, a, it's a watch that connects us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, the, 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 the Daytona was always my grail. It was always kind of a watch that I had always like this status for me, and I don't wear it so often. You know, a lot of the time it's in the bank. Or the watch that always has been with me eh? actually since the early days that I started collecting them. And the funny thing is that it's also um, part of the watch is with me like for 14 years already, I think. Um, it's my Maxi Mark one. Wow. Great watch. Yeah. Such a great watch. Yeah. And for me, for me, you have a few pictures I, I send you. Yeah, let me, if I'm going to go straight into that. I normally wait a little while, but I'm going to just share this one straight away. Here we go. Yeah. Just and, super cool. And for me, for me, you know, the, the Submariner, of course, the 5513 is kind of always the key watch to my, you know, not, not so much to the collection because it sounds too much, but it's to my collecting thing. Um, because whatever I will do, I will always have a 5530. Yeah. It's, it's, and preferably always have a Maxi Mark 1. Mm -hmm. For me, the Maxi Mark 1 is by far the nicest let's say normal 5513 mad dial. Yeah. I mean, there are beautiful guild dials out there, but you know, finding a real nice one these days is, 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 is tremendous and also big funds in, involved. There are many different 5513, depends on completely on their patina and everything, but the, the plots, the, the big plots of the Mark I, and there are all kinds of theories now and Mark III and Mark IV, V, you know, when we started, you had a maxi dial or you had a normal dial. That, yeah. That, that's uh, yeah, absolutely. There was none of the, the, the kind well, of... All these little things came inside. up later yeah. when we looked at it and, and you know, we, we shared that with a big group of people, that knowledge came up also in the Vintage Rolex form and other forms. But for me, always the Mark I with a Tropic 19, you know, plexiglass on it, that was pure sex on the wrist for me. Mm. Every twist that you do, these markers start to dance and they are so big. For me, still, they are the biggest Rolex ever did. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that people say like with the Mark III, because they are touching, they feel they are bigger. But I had enough of these watches next to each other. For me, feel still that the Mark I is the biggest. And um, yeah, it, it, you know, whenever you put this watch on, you can do anything with it. You put anything to it, steel bracelet. You know, not to, not to straps. I, I love to wear it on a NATO also. And, and, yeah, and I think we've got a picture of that we can share. Yeah, it gets that, that kind of tool watch vibe on a NATO strap, which is really, really cool. Gets a little bit that military look. Yeah, yeah. I love to, you know, you just never can go wrong with a nice 5.5.13. That's one part. Mm -hmm. But with a Mark One, it just, I had put, put it two next to so many other 5.5.13. It really blows them away anytime. Mm. So for me, this is really like not only one key watch that has followed me. I mean, this watch I now have, I think, like 
five or six years this 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 sound but before that i always had like or either five five twelve max mark one or uh, other five five thirties max one or even i, I tried a sixteen eighty max mark one with the big same you know plots yeah and then i i took off the cyclops uh, uh plexi and put it on also tropical ninety and it looked fabulous like a you know, had that same kind of quality. And yeah. the nice thing with this one, uh, you know, you, you started about Hulang & Sons. Yes, we, I started the, the brand 2012. The website went live in 2013. And ever since, I think, shortly after, this watch has become kind of a signature watch for us because every strap we pull out, we, we shoot on this watch. This is with every shoot, with everything, this watch is always with us. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really kind of an important watch for me, personally, as, as a submariner. Because the design of the, the, the non-date sub for me is the, still the you know the most timeless, greatest design ever put in a watch. In a way, there are, there are watches that are, that can temporarily itch me more, let's say, or give me more watch. And I said that six two, six three, or six five is really a grail to me. But back to basics, if I only would have the chance to own one watch, it would be that one. Yeah. And it, I think it was important, wasn't it? Because when I think of the Boulang and Sons aesthetic, and obviously the, the brand has been going for eight years now, um, but whenever I kind of, if, if I had to conjure up an image of Boulang and Sons in one picture, it would be the Mark One Maxi with one of the many straps and accessories that you've produced over the years. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because this for me is the fun, you know, the case, the design is so good. As I said, you can you can change your mood you can change everything with it and 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 style it up to your mood you have that day that's what i find so interesting you know i i, I still remember back those days on the forms you had on a lot of forms was like oh no you have to wear your rolex on a, on, a, on that steel original bracelet because otherwise it's not like a real rolex and i was like why you know you mm. can do what, any whatever you want to want to do with it it's 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 just for you know fun and whatever gives you all your pleasure on the wrist and for me, this watch really, you know, has become, and I think it's also like, you know, we all have that Porsche 911 design or Fender, Stratocaster, these things. We have talked about it a lot, but there is something in these designs. I, I collected Eames chairs for many years, you know, all, and, and all kind of design furniture. There was always something also with these old Eames designs from the 50s and I had like Led Chase I had and, you know, the, 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 the lounge chair we still have and, and, and stuff like the aloe chairs. It really always was like you put it, even a design from back then, you put it in a room now and it does something to the room. It adds just something up. It, it changes the aesthetics, the, the vibe of something. Even if you put it in a, in a concrete modern uh, uh, environment or put it in an old castle, it still holds up to it. And this, this is what I think what the, yeah, the 5513 Submariner design really had. It's really that good. And so timeless. So, and I'm, 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 you know, we had a lot of discussions over the years also about Basel World. Yeah. You know, why, how is the evolving of the of the submarine? Now? What is Rolex doing, and why? And why can't they do, you know, this or can't do that? And in the beginning, I was kind of part of that theme, like now they should do this, and they, you know, go all these kind of ways because we find it interesting or redo stuff. And what I've always respected, and this is also, I think, what you see now in the quality of the design of the things of the Submariner, even up to today, as we talked, they are kind of a tanker that follows a course, a steady course. Mm. And it make, keeps, and this is also why the watches are still so valuable and recognizable, and, and, and because they never try to get funky with it or, you know, just pure for marketing, start to put all kinds of features on it. Mm. Uh, it's a steady line, just like a 911. Yes, yeah. has that same kind of quality and stuff. So for me, the five five thirteen certainly is 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 one of the most key watches to to my collecting pleasure. And um, you remember, you know, just just before Corona hit, we started a little initiative, No Date Sub Club. Also, yeah, I was going to talk about celebrate. that. Yeah, just a, you know, we will do more with it in the future again when we can, you know, focus again where on new things. The business became so busy the last months. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that I had to focus back again on 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 getting all the you know the things in Bu at Bulang and Sons uh, not not running but uh, keep up with everything. Um, but but yeah, I'm really for the future. I really want to do more with this and really celebrate the no that no date submariner and yeah. you know try to find a, a knowledge base, share all these images and passion and love for those watches because they really deserve it. Yeah. It's a pretty neat segue then into Watch Three. Talking about no day subs, and we, you know, th this this next watch is 
incredible. Uh, over to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you know what? What the, the the I find it even after like fourteen years or fifteen years of collecting, I started to get more and more and more respect for this kind of, for this watch. Mm. So it really started to grow and grow on me. Um, actually, the funny thing is, my first sports Rolex was a small crown. You know, back then, and back then in those days, you could buy them, of course, for completely different monies than, than yeah. these days. Yeah, yeah. I think you could buy them, still find them on fairs easily for like six, seven, eight thousand euros, nice ones and stuff. So my first one was a six five three six four liner even, and I had no clue how rare it was back then. Yeah. I bought it um, in a shop, and um, it really started, you know, my whole collecting thing. After that, I wanted a five five thirteen and went on like almost like crazy. Uh, maybe sometimes a little bit uh, too crazy. But in those years, I bought a few nice uh, small crowns, tropical ones, all these kind of things, because they always had this kind of quality, but I really liked the size. But also, uh, we called them James Bond back then, where we know, you know, the James Bond, real James yeah. Bond, of course, the big crown, but they're still called kind of a James Bond watch and stuff. Yeah. And I really enjoyed also the bracelet that they were thinner, the cases pop up a little more. And I had a few of them, and then I think till the point that I really went up in my collecting craziness that I bought my first big crown. Um, then once you had the big crown on the, on, 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 the, on the wrist back then, it was like, yeah, goodbye, small crown, because the big crown is so much cooler and has more depth and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. really it was like, I never looked back at small crowns for, what is it, 10 years, nine years or something like this. Mm. Enjoyed them, saw them on meetings, beautiful watches, but hey, I had the big crown and then it was thing. Till a few years ago, I think it was three years ago, I started. I started to look at them again, and I and I was able to to find a nice one. Uh, this one a five five zero eight. Stunning. Full gloss, and and yeah, the light is bad today here, but it even turning brown when it really hits the hits the sun. Wow. Let me sh yeah. let me do a screen here. It has this more greenish greenish loom. Yeah. yeah okay. Like, you sent me a. A stunning yes, picture. Yes, yes. You know, I'm a fan, a real fan of the um, Oyster Rivet bracelet. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's one of the parts. What I yeah, it's one part of the things that I really liked about these old submariners that they had the thinner bracelets, so the case would pop up more towards the the design than in these yeah. days or even like the, the 80s and, and and later 70s with the thicker yeah. bracelets. It became more like a complete thing. The watch and bracelet went into one. Thing and back then you had really had the case pop uh, versus the, the bracelet, yeah. and the way I'm much more comfortable in my opinion. So yeah. for me, I, I, I bought that uh, 558, really enjoyed it. And funny enough, the last year or two, I really, really, really love it more. I, I wear it quite a lot, even to be honest. I wear it now on a, on a, on a super comfortable leather strap. You because sent me it, pictures that. Let me share. Yeah, because it sits so nice on the wrist, it's so. Um, Elegant at the same time, you know, the, the, yeah. where the submariner, where the submariner really, you know, is also still big on your wrist, feels, this one feels so comfortable and one with your wrist mm -hmm. and, and has all these quality, this adventurous thing from the past. So what I really, really like about these these days is the proportion. And yeah. what I really like about wearing this one is that I can go back to kind of a stealth mode with wearing watches. Yes. With vintage watches having gained so much popularity over the last years. If you wear a Daytona on the street, people will look at you. If you wear a Submariner, people will look at you. Not like back in those days, people would say like, oh, he has an old watch. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and the 5508 for me gives me that little bit the back that stealth that I can wear you know, without anyone else noticing because I wear it for myself, not for anyone else. Uh, yeah. But I also think the case is so balanced and so, yeah, so nice in proportions. So I really, you know, once one day I was like, oh yeah, I don't know, the, the, the big crown is, is, is more interesting than the small crown. And these days I find small crowns so interesting and way more all all these different patinas and how they look you know when you get the earlier ones with warmer loom and and sometimes big red triangle insert the later ones with a little bit more greenish the different glosses yeah it's 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 really you know also a valuable watch these days um yeah so it has gained some status over over the, over the years yeah. recognition but for me this is really such a stylish, stylish piece. To yeah, so cool. I mean, I think it took a, it's one of those watches, isn't it, that's been a kind of a slow grow. Um, 
and then last year at Phillips, that new old stock example oh, crazy. that sold for say, like half a million um, for a yeah, big crowd. And I remember talking to you after the, because I was in Geneva for the sale, I was talking to you the following week going like, this is insane. This is insane. Crowd, it was insane. I have no clue why and exa- I haven't seen the watch live, but it was really like, whoa, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and also the fear, to be honest, that the small crown would do that next step where it's, yeah. at a certain point, is out of the you know, reach for so many people, which, yeah. would be a pity, which would be a pity. I mean, they're valuable, but they're still, you know, reasonable. Mm. But yeah, I mean, the craziness is what is reasonable, you know. Prices of these yeah. now is like what big crowns costed like 10, 12 years ago, maybe. Yeah. A little bit less than that, but, okay. uh, you know, but it's the same with the Daytona. So you now pay for Daytona, what you pay for really nice human eight years yeah. or seven years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it just has shifted and these are really grail pieces also still. Mm. But you know, the interesting thing is, what I, what I find, find an interesting question for myself with these kind of pieces, now when they are still getting more expensive, it becomes more difficult. Because I've seen so many of these that really had like great mojo, great uh, character of these watches that weren't yeah. mint the dial often had like you know some life in it or yeah. when they sometimes get uh, tropical they get the dial gets a little not that full gloss tropical brown but gets a little bit more life in it you know what i mean yeah Patina, yeah, yeah yeah absolutely which looked stunning you know yes. which really was like a yeah, very, yeah. very interesting watch yeah and the last years it has switched a little bit like yeah but then i don't take it because it's, it's not perfect and then yeah. when i have to resell it and yeah. Also, when you look at it, just pure, you know, uh, objective, it, it, it would have been a really, really beautiful piece and had a lot of, cur- if you would wear it, I mean, we yeah. have all owned them, the, also yeah. these kind of watches back then that are, yeah. loom wasn't perfect, you know, the dial wasn't perfect, but it was just a pleasure on the wrist. Mm-hmm. And now these days you get a little bit like, yeah, I'm not sure. And, and that's something, you know, I think, um, I, I still wish that you can just enjoy these kind of watches for what they are truly, you know, aged vintage watches with all this charisma emojo on the wrist that you can really be proud of without having that, you know, second thought sometimes like, oh, is it good enough for the next one or is it good enough for this? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's the difficulty maybe a little bit of what price, price changes that have come over the last years is that we look at the watches differently like maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. And we enjoyed it very much back then in that direction. And I hope still that people are enjoying also watches like this or 553 and even if there's a yeah. replacement inlay on it or the, the bracelet has been replaced, the dials have been nice, but yeah. you know, it's, it's the, we both know it, it's a true history of, of, of aging of a vintage watch. If yes. you go to Rolex service, sometimes an inlay get changed, you know, is it that, is it by that now a, a bad watch? No, absolutely not. It's still a beautiful yeah. vintage piece. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and just enjoy it. It's a different value, of course, but it's, yeah. it's still a beautiful piece. So, yeah, the 5508, you know, it, it, it has also that kind of, you know, old time or that vintage feel, that kind yeah. of 50s, 60s vibe to it. Yeah, early yeah. days of dive watches. That, yeah, the early that's days a very of pure, pure yeah, kind of yeah. essence of the form, isn't yeah. it? The no crown yeah. guards. So. It's, very, it's very essence. It's very pure. So that's yeah. what I like so much about it. That's why I also wear it now on that black strap with a dark dial, a little bit yeah. more dark. It feels yeah. almost like, you know, dark nine yeah. sometimes. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it much. Yeah. So from like the real, and I think it's a really true thing to say, from a real kind of hardcore Rolex, vintage Rolex position, you then surprised us all with a kind of a total change of direction to watches that, you know, are, I mean, honestly, in these um, video series, we, we have touched on this. The rise of the next brand has been meteoric and the watches are incredible. And it's a whole new direction. And I can't wait to talk about this with you. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the nice thing is the new direction, you know, is for me also a, a, a trip and a new discovery. Yeah. So that's the interesting part, you know, it's, it's just so exciting. That's, that's the, the great thing of it. As you said, you know, being in that vintage Rolex for like the last 14, 15 years and long years, only hardcore, only doing vintage Rolex, nothing else. Yeah. Occasional mono something. brand, we, mono brand. We, we did some Kudo with it. You know, the, the, the yes. key, key pieces from Tudor, but also some really, really nice Speedmasters, you know, like the early ones to 998 and stuff like that, that which always 
always was sitting in my watch box, but it was always a Rolex mainly focused. And um, now with also the, the, the brand going and, you know, we are getting so many watches also in and out. I always have, you know, Rolex around me. I have the pieces that I want to own. There's still, you know, maybe one or two pieces on my mind. If, if I wanted to buy a really Rolex again, a really nice 6234, you know, pre-Daytona, yeah. that would be still something that I would be really excited about because it has that oyster case and that complexity and, and, and elegance in the dial. That, that friction is, is really interesting. Yeah. But, you know, the last years I was always looking like what next to Rolex I could also find to keep on moving on because once you always stick only into one theme mono theme into it it's it's great but at a certain point you know for my nature i always need to discover new stuff to keep me you know moving forward because also in in with bullang and sons finding different watches or different uh, aesthetics also helps us to develop new styles for other things yes. or finding oh, other things yeah, yeah. so it should always be you know involving and going moving forward and and you have seen that route over the years where I tried to discover all these step case chronographs, yeah. you know, a couple of years back. And for a period of time, I was very deep into them and I just really loved them. Really such nice case shapes in, in, yes. in, in, for the chronographs with the step case, your jeans, but also all these other brands that use these kind of cases back then. Then we had like the Overtonus we went in yeah, yeah. a little bit which are beautiful watches, you know, really amazing uh, pieces. But you could still find certain pieces, not at that, you know, gray level thing. It was yes. still a little bit underrated and still okay. uh, not everyone was, was, was running around with one. We had the dress watches, the big one, jumbo dress watches, Omega. Yeah. I had one from Rolex and stuff, 37, 38 millimeters, which is very, very exciting also, not so much known. Mm. And I think one of the, of the people who inspired me to always keep looking for this stuff is also on, on these watch meetings. And, and, and last year, the, the October meeting in New York, the Raleigh Fest, uh, our friend Jeff organized, um, was really, you know, also a key point for me to, to really, you know, address this for me and really search for different uh, aesthetics and new things and in, 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 in new styles. Uh, because there was always, you know, John Goldberger was always on the meetings. Yeah. Dear friend now for over yeah also all these years he was also yeah. with the fashion meetings always and and always every time when we had that meeting he was just sitting there and relaxed and suddenly he was lifting his arm and you saw the most you know crazy watch on his wrist that you didn't expect yeah he always brought something that was really refreshing and and something different and that always was for me like wow that's why i want to do this a meeting like this not at a certain point because i wanted to see another 20 newmans or another you know the same table shots again but always in this meeting you would find two or three pieces that would really inspire you to look at it in a different way and to find really new you know new yeah forward to find find new uh, kind of watches mm -hmm. and in, in october he had had a crazy uh, minute repeat on and and you know yeah. Completely different aesthetics, and from then I started to look more and more uh, um, to different brands, Movado and all these kind of things, and, and uh, also Cartier. Mm. I had I had owned the Cartier like for the last one and a half year, Basquilante, which really is a cool watch. Yes, really, really nice because what I also like is that it had a, it was the uh, the automatic, so it had a little bit. Uh, oh no, sorry, the manual wind. It had a little bit bigger case size. Yes. That's yeah. yeah. I started to look at the Cartiers like the last year and I always found them a little bit small and everything for me, for my personal taste yeah. till I started to find the bigger pieces and went deeper and, and, and found yeah. some. Yeah, really. What, what I, the strange thing is like two or three years ago, I wouldn't have touched Cartier. You know, it wasn't just not for me. I could respect certain things of it. Um, but the last, I think, yeah, since October, I really started uh, a little Cartier collection. Yeah, I'm gonna show I'm gonna share some pictures. Let's talk about let's talk about this one first, because this is uh this is a cool watch, the Santa. Yeah. yeah. It, it 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 had it, it became my my I think third criteria. What I like about the watch is that it's you know it's it's not a prestige watch mm. in our world. You know, it's I think you can get them somewhere around two and a half or two seven euro uh, yeah. steel automatic movement. And yeah. for years, for many years, I looked at these watches and was like, nah, not for me. It's too 80 or it's too... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was always looking for 60s yeah. watches, 50s watches. Yeah. 70 was already like, yeah, the Daytona or, or Submariner, but yeah. all the 
the round 70 shapers in, from Hoyer and stuff wasn't so much for me. No. And, then came, and then came this, and somehow it gives me that Miami Vice feeling. I don't know. Yeah. It, okay. it has that kind of flashy. With Wall Street. <laughs> yeah, Wall Street, flashy kind of thing. You yeah, know, like yeah. a, a, a guilty pleasure kind of watch, mm. in a way. Yeah. But at the, yeah. same, at the same time, the case shape is really beautiful. You know, if you look at the details, if you look what Cartier does with all these designs and shapes and, and, yeah. and you know, aesthetics and, and, and proportions, yeah. it's absolutely fabulous. You know, I don't, to be honest, I know nothing about movements from these Cartiers. Uh, yeah. I couldn't care less for myself. Mm. You know, of course, when we sell something, we do all the, the research. But for myself, it's all about the aesthetics of these watches. And certainly with these Cartiers, Mm. What they do with me when I put them on the wrist. Yeah. What, what I can dive in from this kind of 80s vibe with my clothing or with my style to mm. something completely different when it suddenly becomes really, really classy or classic. Yeah. So it's, it's, this watch for me really um, yeah, is, is kind of a surprise. I wear them loose, you know, put some, put some bracelets next to it or little things. or just yeah. This would be my summer watch, I guess, when I go to the beach I would bring this one with me. Yeah. Just, just you know, yeah. unpretentious, fun, yeah. and a lot of style, and a lot of style in it. So that's that's really for me the cool thing. What I really like about all these catches uh, is for me it's really like a big discovery. You know, when, uh, when you have the book, uh, uh, the gentleman's um, what is it, files, and yeah. you look. When I look on Instagram now and all yeah. these the Cartier archives and stuff yeah. they inspire me also with all these different shapes which are really actually very rare you know yes. you look at what you say like oh wow I also want one and yeah. then suddenly it's like yeah likely not to happen uh, yeah you just can't find them I mean look, you've sent a picture of these two as well just talk me through this pair because again it's a classic look isn't it there's a they're so different to yeah. the Santos and the other watches but there's a obviously a design but uh, yeah, what, you know, what, what, yeah, absolutely. But the really interesting thing for me about this is the the left one is the is the jumbo tank automatic from the seventies. Yeah, which for me was my 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 after the Basque land was my first real cache. I bought it from a friend, and once he he had it on his wrist, we had like this watch little watch dinners uh, uh, with friends uh, once a week, mm -hmm. and he was wearing it. and was like it itched me, you know. It was really like wow, I need this watch. It, it really was so exciting because the size is big. You know, normally, as you said, the caches are very, very small. But yeah. this one, I don't know out of my head, but it, I think it's somewhere about 27 or 28 by yeah. 30 something. Yeah. So it's really the jumbo. And on the wrist, it's really big. Um, yeah. So it has... It, I think it, we've got a picture of this one on its own, actually, as well, haven't we? Uh, yeah. I think so, yeah. There we go. Yeah, super. Yeah. So it's 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 that all that classic cache look. Uh, yeah. I, I wear it now with an with an uh, old style uh, lizard strap. Yeah. Which, which yeah, I mean, I I like to wear it with you know outfit I have like on yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah. It has that kind of strange yeah. friction because normally you would expect like a you know a suit or anything with this kind of watch, the really classy thing. Yeah. And I and I enjoy just wearing it with some sneakers and and, yeah. and military stuff and all. That, and that's for me kind of the theme in this in this Cartier thing is that looking yeah. for that friction because yeah. I would have never thought of myself as a Cartier guy. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And and now I'm, to be honest, I'm wearing them most of the time. Yeah. Um, uh, because it's such an exciting thing to put it on and and, yeah. and feel what it really does to me it, and and, yeah. and and the the kind of resonates on my wrist yeah. with everything I do. So it's really exciting. Um, yeah. And, and also what is really nice about this watch is, you know, the, on the back, they have that little bubble to hold the automatic movement. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's also just a nice detail you, know, you wouldn't expect. But it makes also, it takes care that it sits a little bit higher on the wrist. So it, it's not really a small, a small piece. My colleague in no. the office, Giacomo, he was wearing Cachi all already before me. He was already discovering them. He had some smaller pieces that yes. were just a little too small for me. But when I found this one, yeah, this one I think will be also a really a keeper because it's yeah, it's just the perfect balance for me in size and and and, and so comfortable to wear. Yeah. So for me, it's it's really beautiful. The and other one, this one, yeah, I'm going to share. We've got an individual picture. This the case is outstanding, isn't it? Yeah. For me, this one is kind of a surprise of of, of earlier this year. I was on the watch fair in Munich, and I was indeed had to you know was there running around and also looking for some 
stranger, as I said, you know, inspired by John Goldberg, are trying to find something that is really a little bit out of the ordinary. When I put it on the wrist, that it's really some funky thing. Yeah. And, I, and I saw this one and I knew immediately I need to have it. It's, it's a crystal law. It's also quite a big size for, for, for Caché. It's a manual wind. And I think it's one of the not so popular models from their lineup over the years and everything. But maybe that's something that's exactly that's what attracts me to it. When most people might not find it the most uh, popular one, then I find it very popular. Yeah. Um, and it's so not me in a way over the last year, because I think when I picked it up, you would have said like, Ben, what are you doing? Yeah, no, I think I did say that when you picked that up. I think you yeah, sent yeah. a picture of it from the fair, and I was like, yeah. this, what, what's happened what, to what, you? What, you know, we need to have a coffee and, and look at some oyster cases, mate. Yeah, yeah. what did you yeah. smoke? But it's so cool on the wrist. Yeah. You know, it feels, it's kind of my Italian watch, let's say. You know? Yeah, it's, okay. Yeah, I don't yeah. know, it feels like, you know, it feels so cool on the wrist to wear it. I, I even wear it. I, I first wanted to put on a new strap, which is not easy. It's a special strap from Cartier. You have to have to get the shape. This is a really old strap that has all these marks in it and, you know, beaten up crocodile. But cool. it's, now that, it's so um, soft and, and, and flexible. So I'm wearing on it and I'm not sure I want to change it for very soon because it has that kind of, I don't give a fuck kind of <laughs> yeah. Feeling. Which I really love with it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, if this wear it for me, it's really like yeah, uh, it's it's the watch that that is, you know, breaking up with everything that I ever believed I would do. You know, I'm I'm I, in my, I'm not an article guy. I don't have article interior. So you know, I always was that design classics and maybe fifty yeah. kind of yeah. aesthetics. But this one is really cool to me. You know, it's, oh, it's, it's so good. And there are so many cool shapes from Cartier. When you look at these kind of things, the, the gondole, which have become expensive. I saw a lady with, with a friend, yet like white gold, which was like, wow, the big one, really big one, like uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Guys, which are really, really cool. But they are now already in a price league where I say like, I, I don't know if this is for me, but um, this was still, you know, super cool find where you maybe have a watch that is around four, four and a half thousand euros where you can really, yeah. yeah. 80 karat gold where you can really have a lot of fun without yeah. breaking the bank. Yeah. So talking about interesting shapes and, yeah. and, and, and fascinating watches, this, I'm going to just go straight into this amazing picture that you sent me. I mean, look at that. This is yeah. cool. This, and, this, and a benchmark moment for you in terms of metals. Yeah. It's my first platinum watch. I never owned a platinum watch. I had white gold and yellow golds. Not so many yeah. in the past, yellow gold, so I mean, many steel. So this one was my first platinum. Now I'm a serious guy now, you know, I'm grown up. Yeah, you've reached platinum so, status. I reached platinum, yeah. <laughs> but what for me was the most interesting in this, you know, I have seen that model over the last one and a half year when I was looking. And I was always like, yeah, nah, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a little bit too, you know. Now I'm really getting like a chest of heel or something and I need to get <laughs> old and in a way so it was maybe too classic for me but but a friend of mine uh, dig this one out and i showed it to me and i was for me i was like yes i, I need it yeah. it's really it's really such a funky shape and it and, and great size because it's not really that small one it's it's one i think out of the 90s i haven't i have it for a few days now to be honest uh, yeah yeah so i haven't done all the research but imagine this this design is like from it's 114 years old. This this design is from 1906. Yeah. So it's really, you know, and I'm spoiling immediately that I wear it different these days. Yeah, well, I was just going to come on to that. I mean, that, I'll share that now because obviously in line with what you do. If you, if you, if you can go back to the other picture, is that okay? With yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first one. Yeah, yeah. Because there you see the full glory of that watch in a way. Yeah. It has that complicated dial with all, you know, the typical Cache elements in it. Um, the shape is beautiful balance. I mean, really, I think Cartier does, when you look also, I see now the four, the four watches in front of me, mm. the, the, the shapes and the balance in, in design, you know, mm. the aesthetics and, and the proportions are just all perfect. It's, it's, it's crazy. So I'm totally in love with these kind of pieces. Now with yeah. this one, uh, what, what a lot of, you know, the early ones and, and, and up to this model, Often, sometimes I think the critic was that the, the, the bracelet is too thin for the proportion of yeah. the watch. It has that. It's also called the dandy watch, maybe by that, you know? Yeah, okay. 
yeah but but i find it really the challenge to just also wear it like that because it, you know if you can pull off this you can pull off anything you know yeah yeah, right? yeah yeah you know wear it like you you want to i'm 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 not so you know strict to rules i r rather break the rules or play Always with them break the rules yeah. 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 And, and, but, but it has like, it has that kind of proportion with the thinner strap that really, where we normally would say, oh, it fits with a really elegant guy, you yeah. know, in a suit and a really nice shirt. Now I don't wear shirts and mm. stuff like, you know, mm. it's all this kind of uh, feeling to it. Yeah. And for me, there was really the search, like when I got it, yes, it's great. And I wore, have been wearing it for two or three days with a thin strap and, yeah. um, Somehow that felt a little bit less comfortable because it's a thinner strap on a platinum, a little bit more heavier watch. So yeah. I like it a little bit more heaven. I was thinking, well, and what else can I do with it that it brings it really into my world? And mm. Yeah, I guess you have then that next picture where it shows a little bit yeah. where I try to wear it with. This is cool. I mean, this is this could almost like sum Bulangan suns up in so many yeah. ways. And, and, and well, sum you up and therefore the Bulangan suns are static because even like, you know, you've totally changed up how you're wearing the watch. And then it's kind of what you're wearing it with. I mean, that, that cool kind of in, industrial look of the jacket with, um, you Yeah, know, an old miners jacket. Yeah, miners jacket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, but with then the cuff, um, I, I've been with this very delicate platinum Cartier. Yeah, that, I mean, you have a phrase for that, don't you? Um, that yeah, it's a kind of a pleasant friction. Yeah, 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 yeah. For me, it's always the search and what we do, kind of a pleasant friction. For me, it's you know, if if sometimes you really find the balance where it's something supposed to be, and it's the same like you know, you put it on on top of each other, and it's nice, it's fine, it's good like this. Mm -hmm. But sometimes then it gets boring for me. For me, it's always the search. How can I combine certain things that when they when they interact with each other, it creates something new, it becomes something yeah. different. And, and for me, it was wearing the watch with that cuff. Um, I took over a Newman strap that, that we do and, and, and had. Um, suddenly, it became a completely different watch. Yeah. It became more of a statement than it became like an, yeah. you know, very refined uh, connoisseur, yeah. understated piece you had on your wrist. It suddenly became more like a fashion thing yeah. for me. So I really enjoy it with that, and, and I will mix and match and flip and flop with it all the time. But it's, yeah, this one has been on the wrist for the last days for me, and I really, really enjoy it. And also, you know, if you look at the shape also from the sides. It's, it's great, isn't it? Wow, well, look at the crystal. Really, wow. Yeah, the crystal has, has, that, yeah. has that shape also, you know, you see. So it's, yeah. Cool. It's really so cool designed, and, and, and um, yeah, it... it it really, you know, I really still remember a few years ago, I was sitting in a hotel in Geneva, shooting a collection from a friend uh, with some plans back then to maybe do a book. Uh, and he had a cache, something like that. I don't know exactly more, but it had also, you know, these, the crown and then all these little details in the dial and it was like really close up. And back then already was like, wow, you know, it, it isn't my style. But when you look into detail on what, how much detail is on the dial eventually, Mm. It was really beautiful, you know. Really, already then was like, wow! I somehow I one day I have to discover more about it. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, now I'm I'm a Cartier collector personally. Yeah. Must, king, the know. king of Cartier. I don't know. No, I don't know. To be honest, the fair word is if you if you you know we never started it. There are so many people who are doing this yeah. already for the last year. Now yeah. Cartier is becoming more and more popular. Uh, the last year, some dealers pick it up and make it try to make it big now and 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 everything. I try to keep it a little bit low profile still, so I can still find some pieces at reasonable yeah. prices. Yeah, don't don't and build it up too much because you still no, want to enjoy no. collecting them. Because, yeah, because you, there are so cool things out there, also from different yeah. brands. Yeah. But you know, the honor to to the people that are, you know, they're also like people like Eric Koo and others, and yeah. certainly yeah. also awesome. certainly old John Goldberger, who, who you know collected these pieces already like twenty years ago and already saw the beauty of these way before we did. And it's now great that you see like uh, you know people on Instagram and, and you know writing book uh, yeah. that are way putting out way more information about these yeah. kind of watches and the brand because yeah. for me the brand and the watches and also wasn't even you know till maybe a year ago was a complete darkness but yeah. also what if you would google for information it would be very hard yeah. you know with vintage rollers you could find a lot of things with this it was very hard to really move forward.
So yeah, at the moment, Cartier is, is my uh, venom. And, awesome. and yeah, try to find some existing things. For, uh, cool. So we've had a great journey here through um, some of the most iconic vintage Rolex and finish with some um, fantastic Cartiers. We also like to talk about a book. Um, so if you were going to spend some time, well, you're currently spending time with me, but what would your, what would your Desert Island book be? And I, I was thinking of the book because I told you once before, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not reading all these books. I'm, I'm a visual guy, mm. you know, uh, I, I've been always been a designer. So for me, the visual thing is more that so I'm not yes. reading, reader, reader, reader. Um, what would be really, really interesting if I would go now to an island, I would really take this book. I have been starting reading it a while ago. Oh, my cool. surprise for you. It's a Porsche book. It's called The Ultimate Sports Car as Cultural Icon. Wow. Okay. Uh, and what is interesting about this book, you know, we, we, we had it in the shop and I was really astonished with it. It's really cool, you know, cool images of Porsches in the 70s and stuff like that. Wow. Super. But it's, but it's a book also about the culture and all, you know, how was it designed? What was in the development? But also owners, stories from owners, um, you know, and, and a kind of a historical aspect and cultural aspect to it, towards the style, to, to certain cars and models in the in the in the period of, of, of time and what why why do i also want to to show you this book for me is how hell how great would it be if some book of this like this would be there for the rolex at moment yeah you know what, yeah. what i find you know it, it maybe it's one of my ambitions for the future or something to find the time um to really you know write down this you know, the, the cultural aspect of an iconic watch like that. Mm, yeah. You know, maybe something in, in our No Date Sub Club, we will do this or something at, at a certain point. You know, yeah. as I said, like, you know, this is just like stories about a guy the first time he was sitting on a Porsche or whatever he wow. experienced. Design studies, you know, how fantastic would it be if maybe even let's dream and we are on an island. Rolex would participate and would say, I really write down the, the thing if we could find some kind of design sketches. From the, yeah, from well, the, that'd I mean, be amazing. Or, yeah, yeah. or, or, you know, prototypes or anything. And you could really, you know, just like with Porsche does with his 911, you put in the heritage, not only in there, but also the stories of the people. You know, I, I, had, I had a talk with a dear friend about like Millsops uh, a while ago, in, in the beginning of this year, who is really deep into the Millsops and also has met a lot of the original owners. Hmm. And my fear for our watch hobby is that a lot of these stories just get lost. Because, you know, collectors who are in this for a long time now, maybe also with all the biting and bitting sometimes on the Instagram and stuff, um, they rather shut up or they, they keep, you know, keep more for themselves, which is a pity. But wouldn't it be great to have a really great book to honor that timeless classic watch where you could put all these kind of stories, you know, how are these watches used in, as a tool watch? How yeah. are these things, you know, develop what really comics divers did with these watches to understand even if you buy a Submariner today, what kind of DNA really is in there. Yeah. Or but also people who have maybe enjoyed their watch for sixty years and yeah. you know. so it for me, a book like this I um, really want to, you know, I'm going to read, but also I would be a really great start to maybe do this for Rolex and five after that and uh, well, it. We heard it here first, the No Date Sub Club book coming soon. Well, who knows, who knows. The bookshelf near you, to, to a desert <laughs> island near you soon. I think I need two years on a desert island to, to get in this project. <laughs> well, Bernard, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. Um, I've got, great, bro. I've got a couple of jumbo shrimp that I've got uh, yeah. ready to go on the barbie. So let's grab our drinks, grab the watches and our book, <laughs> and then we'll go and uh, enjoy that. And uh, thanks yeah, for coming to the in. island. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.